Welcome to the Seam Lund Podcast. I'm your host, Seam Lund, and today our guest is Dr. James De Antonio. Dr. James and I released our new book called The Blood Sugar Fix, How to Achieve Optimal Blood Sugar Levels and Insulin Sensitivity for a Healthier and Longer Life. You can get the book from Amazon. Uh, wait, what, what number is this now? It's like a sixth book <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and this one this time is it's kind of a continuation in a lot of ways to the obesity fix. Uh, because it kind of covers something very similar, like um, in terms of metabolic um, dysfunction and uh, like obesity and diabetes and blood sugar dysregulation and insulin resistance, they're very like closely connected to each other. So uh, yeah, maybe we can start with, uh, you know, what is some of the things that people need to look out for when it comes to, let's say, glucose intolerance and what are like how do they actually know if they're if they have some you know problems related to that yeah it's a great question so i mean i think a lot of people like inherently know sugar sweetened beverages are bad for you for your blood sugar and so a lot of people will kind of cut that out and think that's that's enough and this book really sort of takes many different things into account and that if you hit each checkbox it's definitely going to improve your blood sugar levels so um, you know, whether that's being under muscled and not having the muscle to soak up the glucose and to handle a combination of carbs and fat, which we talk about like the Randall cycle and how, when you combine two macronutrients, unless you're kind of highly active or you have a good amount of muscle, your body has a hard time metabolizing both carbs and fats at the same time, which can eventually elevate blood sugar levels. Um, a lot of people too, I think in the real world, are eating a lot of like whole grains thinking it's healthy, but that's contributing to a lot of elevation in blood sugar levels. Um, we know, and we discuss this in the book too, that refined sugars are actually more harmful than refined carbohydrates and they're hidden in everything. 75% of the packaged foods in the United States contain hidden added sugars, which is a problem. And then one thing that we touch on as well, that really hasn't been covered in other books is numerous nutrient deficiencies can lead to not just elevations in blood sugar, but have literally been shown to cause prediabetes and diabetes. And we can, you know, cover that as well, but that's sort of like an overall umbrella of what the blood sugar fix book is. Mm, yeah. So it, you know, obviously uh, we, it's not only about, yeah, like diabetes, uh, although it can help the, you know, pathology and symptoms of diabetes, uh, it's more yeah, about, about like, um, the main message is like prevention. How do you make sure that you don't develop this uh, poor glucose tolerance? And uh, like, what are the things to do to just overall improve your insulin sensitivity? Because I mean, it's just healthier to have better glucose, uh, you know, metabolism and uh, insulin sensitivity, which then, you know, determines your other like uh, disease risk as well. Like, because if you have diabetes, then your uh, risk of cardiovascular disease doubles at least. And uh, the risk of dying prematurely also increases quite significantly because uh, diabetics, they do have like a five to 10 year shorter life expectancy just from diabetes alone. And if you get like cardiovascular disease as well from that, then that can be like 20 years shorter life expectancy uh, quite quite, you know, easily. Right. Yeah. And that, that brings up a good point too. Um, a lot of heart attacks are actually caused by pre-diabetes and type two diabetes, but really aren't labeled as such, right? Like most people don't view it as you had a heart attack because you've had elevated insulin and glucose for 20 years. Most people just kind of blame it on red meat or eggs or salt or saturated fat and say, that's why you had a heart attack. Um, and the thing is too, is we don't really diagnose type two diabetes until someone's had the disease for at least a decade and they've lost like 50% of their beta cells. Mm -hmm. So it's really a disease of metabolism. Like you are, your actual machinery, your engine isn't fully able to kind of get substrates through the full process of the Krebs cycle and give you the full ATP output. It's like things are sort of backing up. You're going into actual harmful pathways. You're forming more advanced glycation end products. So it's, it's really like a disease of metabolism causing enhanced oxidative stress and elevated glucose and insulin are like a symptom of basically the clogged up machinery. Mm. Yeah. In Estonia, like the translation of diabetes is like sugar disease. Uh, but and there's actually like a, at least like a dozen different other contributing factors to getting di diagnosed with diabetes. And it's just that the 
end result usually is this hyperglycemia, high blood sugar levels, chronically elevated blood sugar levels that don't go down, um, you know, as a normal normal person should do because it's like normal to still have like these swings and blood sugar every day like when you eat something it's normal for your blood sugar to rise and in a healthy metabolism the blood sugar goes down because the body releases insulin and the body is insulin sensitive to uh, or the cells are insulin sensitive to respond to the insulin and let the glucose into the cells but in uh, diabetes like over time what happens is that you know the insulin either insulin production doesn't uh, isn't enough like they diabetics don't produce enough insulin or the cells are resistant to the insulin so that they're kind of you know shut off from the message or the signal of insulin and that's why the blood sugar stays elevated for much longer and that's like generally the characteristic of um, diabetes like this hyperglycemia plus insulin resistance that uh, the yeah like the cells don't respond to insulin right and uh, yeah like for, for some like you know actual numbers for people to look at like your blood sugar levels obviously are one of the like diagnostic diagnostic uh, your tools for uh, d- diagnosing like either pre-diabetes or actual diabetes. If you have like a normal blood sugar in the morning should be like below, below 100 milligrams per deciliter, which is like less than 5.6 uh, millimoles per liter. If you have, let's say some aspects of impaired glucose tolerance or starting to indicate some pre-diabetes, then it's about 100 up to 125 milligrams or 5.6 to 7. And if you have above 126 milligrams uh, or uh, seven millimoles, then that's diagnosed as diabetes um, in the like, at least like the blood sugar marker. But there's also like the uh, hemoglobin A1C that uh, measures or indicates the average blood sugar over the past few uh, weeks. And it measures like this glycated hemoglobin in the blood and um, normal levels are less than 5.7%. Impaired glucose tolerance is 5.7% until 6.4% and diabetes is over 6.5%. Uh, yep. Um, and, you know, a lot of, there's like certain buckets like that can contribute to elevations in glucose. And of course, those elevations in glucose happen after elevations in insulin. So really a, a what's called a postprandial insulin assay, um, which basically you, you chug some glucose and you look at insulin levels for out to four hours that will be higher. You'll, you'll be hyperinsulinemic for years, even decades before you'll see elevations in, let's say, fasting glucose. Um, and even before you'll see elevations in um, postprandial glucose elevations, because high insulin will keep those postprandial glucose levels looking good, but you have, you're, you're basically producing way more insulin than a normal person to keep that glucose curve looking normal. So what happens, what contributes to that would be there's so many different people in so many different buckets and, and some people are in all the buckets, whether it's, you're not lifting enough weights, you don't have enough muscle, you're over consuming bad, let's say carbs and sugars. And, and so you're, but then there's within that, you actually don't even have to over consume calories to induce prediabetes and type two diabetes. If you get the total amount of sugars from added sugars in your diet at 15% or higher, that is enough to induce prediabetes and type two diabetes, even not in being in a caloric surplus. So, you know, there's an argument that says, well, in order to lose weight, you have to be in a calorie deficit, but you don't have to be in a calorie deficit. Or even if you are, if you have enough refined sugars, you can absolutely cause insulin resistance and and type 2 diabetes. So just being in a calorie, let's say, deficit isn't a a cure or a prevention for type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. Hmm. Yeah, it can certainly like, it can probably create a bigger buffer zone, like because if you're overeating calories and you eat a lot of sugars, then you probably get diabetes faster than being in a calorie deficit and uh, overeating sugar. But yeah, like it's, it's just, you know, for uh, for like prevention, metabolic health uh, and optimal metabolic health, yeah, you need to have obviously like a good diet as well that uh, doesn't have like a ton of added, uh, let's say refined carbohydrates and added sugars because yeah, like those are the probably one of the biggest, let's say predictors of uh, developing diabetes, like the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages and uh, refined carbohydrates. Right. And there, I mean, there are some studies that show if you eat, 
like a 50% calorie deficit, which is tremendous. No one's going to be able to stay at that, like only eating a thousand calories a day. If most of your calories are coming from refined sugars, like you won't gain weight. You probably won't develop type two diabetes right away. We don't really know. We don't have studies going out long enough, but that's in a severe calorie deficit. You, you know, we need studies that can actually apply to like, what is a typical person consuming in a day? We have numerous studies like that where people are consuming 2,700 calories a day and simply replacing, let's say 20% of their calories from refined carbs with refined sugars causes worsening in insulin sensitivity, higher insulin levels, higher glucose levels. So we know actually refined sugars are more harmful than refined carbs, even when matched for calories and when being consumed at a normal calorie intake of, let's say like 2,700 calories. Mm, yeah. And why do, let's say the liquid calories of sugar, why, why are those like worse? Liquid calories are even worse, but um, this would just be like, say, let's say like, um, like refined white crystal and sugar is worse than refined like starch. Um, but then a liquid form is even worse because the satiety from liquids is much less than food. So when you start consuming sugar sweetened beverages, there's been numerous studies that once you introduce them, total calorie intake automatically increases. So there's another argument that people will say, well, it doesn't matter as long as you keep your calories like, you know, in a calorie deficit, then, you know, whatever. But that's not what happens in the real world. When people start drinking soda, start drinking sugar sweetened beverages, their calorie intake increases. So it is a harm of liquid sugar that causes more calories to be consumed. So you can't eliminate that harm and be like, well, if you just keep it at a calorie deficit, then liquid sugars aren't going to be harmful. That's great if it if if we're all in a metabolic ward and we control people's total calorie intakes, but the people live in the real world. And when you give them access to sugar sweetened beverages, unfortunately their calorie intake increases. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of goes to the individual cases. Like there's of course, you know, uh, like examples of individuals being able to do that, like some you know high level, let's say a physically active person can obviously consume liquid, uh, you know, sugars and uh, added sugars as well, and still maintain health and not develop diabetes. Uh, but yeah, like, but there is still like a clear uh, in epidemiology, there's a clear association between uh, sugar sweetened beverage consumption and added sugar intake and diabetes. So yeah, like individually, you know, you and I, we can probably add sugar and uh, you know, sodas into our diet and manage it in a, like a short term to not get any, you know, harmful changes to our biomarkers uh, significantly. But uh, like someone who, yeah, in the real world, who doesn't count calories or who, who don't know about the calorie content, et cetera. It's just that the association of that generally is associated with, yeah, increased calorie intake plus, you know, the worsening of biomarkers from that. And uh, yeah, like in the real world, you know, the, you know, epidemiology is still <laughs> in some ways, you know, epidemiology has a lot of flaws, but it's still, you know, in the real world, when you let people into the wild, so to say, into the wild of their <laughs> free free living world, then they're going to do what, can, what they're going to do. And uh, yeah, there are just some associations with we know exist. Yeah. I mean, even so when I, it's not even just epidemiology, there's actually been numerous clinical studies where they give people access to sugar sweetened beverages. They literally start increasing their calorie intake. They gain more body fat just by giving them and having them and giving them access to sugar sweetened beverages. So it's been proven in clinical, numerous clinical studies, actually. I, um, one of my uh, presentations to the Canadian Senate was, was actually showed a, a, some of those clinical studies. But, um, you know, essentially, yeah, like if you're an active person, you know, you can get away with even some refined sugars, particularly post-exercise, right? Because your muscle is a tremendous source of, of glycogen storage, right? Where you can store a lot of glucose. So it depends on the person. It depends on their activity, depends on the nutrient background, but, um, yeah, overall, I think reducing your amount of calories that come in liquid form is definitely going to be beneficial. Yeah. And with uh, the sugar sweetened beverages, it's one, one, yeah, like thing that still happens. And I mean, it's less likely to happen in a calorie deficit, but especially in a calorie surplus, uh, then what you do uh, promote more is the visceral fat uh, accumulation, which is like the internal uh, fat around the organs, which we know is actually, yeah, one of the predictors of diabetes as well. 
uh, because it kind of you know it's less metabolically active or you uh, you can actually start to secrete more of these um, pro-inflammatory cytokines from there and we know like you know that the subcutaneous fat under the skin isn't that, that harmful than the visceral fat around the organs and uh, sugar sweetened beverages especially uh, added fructose the industrial fructose not the, the fructose from the fruit that is one of the biggest things that you know promotes the visceral fat gain as well yeah it, it, exactly and so there's a fine line between yes being in a calorie deficit does help you handle more let's say sugars and things like that but it doesn't prevent you from having harm from let's say a, a sugar bomb like when you consume a lot of added fructose your cells metabolize that um and there's oxidative stress bursts that occur in the intestinal cells and in the kidney cells um, and if you keep doing that, even if you're in a calorie deficit, you're going to start damaging organs, just like a calorie deficit doesn't prevent your teeth from getting cavities. If you consume sugar, sweetened beverages. Um, so there's certain harms that are going on that can't necessarily be eliminated just by being in a calorie deficit. Yeah. And, um, we shouldn't, you know, let's say, or, or actually, yeah, we can, we can continue on with a little, a little bit of on the, um, carbohydrates and sugar side. So, uh, you know, the amount of carbohydrates and the glycemic load of the food that you eat is yeah one of the biggest predictors of you know how much your blood sugar rises in response to a meal so uh, yeah we can maybe talk a little bit about you know what can we do obviously most people already know that they shouldn't eat sugar and a lot of uh, refined carbohydrates so like what should they eat and how can they like manage their blood sugar response yeah so so you know most people aren't just going to eat a single carbohydrate on itself. They'll have some protein, they'll have some fat that'll curb the glucose curve, right? And it'll be less of a spike. We see that even with 100% whole grains, most of them are ran through a steel roller mill. The particle size is very small. And instead of getting like a, like a small glucose spike and then back to normal baseline, you get a really high spike and you actually go hypoglycemic as well. So you go too low. Um, and so that leads to a vicious cycle of literally craving the sugars and then you overshoot again and then you undershoot and that's a huge problem. So even 100% whole grains, most of the time are issues, um, particularly breads, like 100% whole, whole grain bread. So the healthy carbs would be vegetables and fruit, really. I mean, it's as simple as that. Now, some people who are severely insulin resistant may not want to have too much fruit. They might only want to have one or two pieces of fruit per day until they become more insulin sensitive or they start working out more. But in general, replacing um, whole grains with fruit and vegetables and replacing refined sugars um, with, whole gr uh, with fruits and vegetables as well, those are going to be the, the best switches in regards to, you know, carb sources. Mm. And uh, yeah, protein is important for the satiety and the weight loss. But also like yeah, adding protein to the meal lowers the uh, glucose response to the meal. And yeah, like uh, we can we should say that it's normal for the blood sugar again to rise. But if it stays elevated for you know hours and hours after eating, then that's a sign of insulin resistance and uh, poor glucose tolerance. So it's not you don't really have to fear the spikes or the rises uh, in blood sugar after eating. It's just yeah, like there you know the longer it stays elevated, the kind of worse it is. Yeah, like fear the really high spikes that are super physiologic, that are abnormally high. Fear the ones that, and, he, and the thing is, is you could be producing a ton of insulin and maybe that's why it's not staying elevated though. So you might see a curve that, oh, the curve looks pretty good, but you, you just shot your insulin sky high to keep it low. So really avoid the, the, the super physiological spikes, which are going to be driven by the whole grains and they're going to be driven by the um, refined sugars in particular, in, in particular in beverage form. But like you said, adding protein, um, adding fiber and adding fat to a meal will all reduce the glucose spike, um, will increase satiety. And so that's one way to sort of buffer. And we talk about also apple cider vinegar, like one to two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar diluted in about eight ounces of water, you know, 15 minutes or even during a meal can reduce the glucose spike. And then like a 10 to 15 minute, ideally 15 minute walk after a meal will also help reduce glucose spikes as well. And then the other sort of hack is 
berries, like polyphenols from berries can help reduce the glucose spike as well. Mm, yeah. Vinegar, you know, some olive oil or, um, I mean, nuts do also have been found to lower the blood sugar response, but it's probably because they have like added fats, maybe a little bit of fiber and the polyphenols as well. But yeah, like the, I think the biggest, uh, you know, leverage or the lever in uh, affecting the postprandial glucose response is going to be uh, like just making sure that the meal is high in protein and fiber and uh, maybe apple cider vinegar. But yeah, like you, you can just increase your insulin sensitivity by making sure that you have like moved around or exercised around uh, the meal. So like before and after like a walk. And I mean, yeah, like just, you know, exercising is just like a, such a crucial part in all of this. Like if you don't exercise, then your body is never going to be actual insulin sensitive in a lot of ways <laughs> like uh, because if you exercise then just you know you could sit yeah on the couch and still be very insulin sensitive and still have like a very normal response to the meal and uh, it's just that many people are sedentary and they don't have that enough muscle tissue so they're you know the, because the muscle is the largest kind of uh, you know bank for, for uh, storing glucose inside the body and if your if your muscles are activated and uh, let's say depleted of the glucose then just, they're just gonna be like a like they're just gonna soak up all the glucose without really affecting the blood sugar response after the meal that much right yep and then the other thing is too is just being deficient in numerous nutrients single nutrients um so take for example thiamine Back in 1939 and back in 1940, there were a couple of studies done that literally showed within just a couple of weeks, but certainly within two to three months, if you are consuming less than 0.15 milligrams of thiamine per day, that leads to prediabetes and type two diabetic glucose curves. So we've known for over 80 years that to being, being deficient in one vitamin, vitamin B1 thiamine can literally cause prediabetes and type two diabetes. Virtually no clinician knows about this, and certainly the general public doesn't know about this. And the reason is, is because thiamine sits at the top of glucose metabolism. So in order to oxidize glucose, you know, you got to go through glycolysis. There's enzymes that will take glucose to pyruvate and then bring pyruvate into the Krebs cycle, right, um, via acetyl-CoA, um, and then, you know, form ATP. So all these enzymes require thiamine. Uh, transketolase is one. Now, transketolase is important too because it keeps glucose running to the pyruvate Krebs cycle pathway, pushes it away from that advanced glycation end product pathway. So when you're deficient in thiamine, you produce less advanced glycation end products, you produce less oxidative stress, and now you're bringing glucose um, into the Krebs cycle, right? As uh, you know, pyruvate slash, and then you have acetyl CoA. But Pyruvate dehydrogenase in order to bring pyruvate into the Krebs cycle. That enzyme requires thiamine. And then alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, another enzyme that converts alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl CoA in the Krebs cycle requires thiamine. So, literally, for you, your body to make ATP out of glucose, you need thiamine. And that's why, if you're deficient in it, it can cause type 2 diabetes. Now, the form of thiamine that actually activates those enzymes is thiamine diphosphate or pyrophosphate. It's an activated form. You have to activate it in the body. And the, uh, the other nutrient that's required to do that is magnesium. So if you're deficient in thiamine, you're deficient in magnesium, that can literally induce type two diabetes or prediabetes. Mm, yeah, and uh, yeah, magnesium deficiency is almost linearly associated with increased heart disease as well as uh, diabetes. Uh, but yeah, like where, where can people get the uh mag you know magnesium as well as uh, thiamine so that's a good question um so thiamine one of the best sources that we used to think was pork now more recent samples that have looked at pork have been going down and that's probably because as carbon dioxide goes up the thiamine in plant foods goes down and then thus animals feed on those lower thiamine plant foods so both plants and animals now have less thiamine so and many things can cause thiamine deficiency. So I used to never even care about vitamin B1 or thiamine. I never looked into it for a long time because I knew that all our refined carbs, most of them were fortified with B1, just a little bit, not a ton though. And I was like, well, if it's fortified, we're, you know, shouldn't be a problem. 
But the thing is, is so many things, we don't store a lot of thiamine. This is the key. We only store about 30 milligrams. So you can become rapidly depleted in all of your thiamine stores within days, just being sick. Like if you have an infection, inflammation, um, activity, when you are more physically active, your thiamine requirements dramatically skyrocket. And then anything like even diarrhea, drinking coffee or tea close to your intake of foods have basically polyphenols and things that will inactivate thiamine, but also reduce the absorption of thiamine. Raw, raw sh shellfish, so like um, sushi and things like that, um, sulfites will break down thiamine. Um, so certain wines. So there's all these things and you start adding all these things up. Once I started learning that, I started understanding, okay, thiamine deficiency is a huge issue here. Not to mention that simply having a high carb diet dramatically increases your need for thiamine. So there was some good studies where they, they gave people parenteral nutrition, you know, high in carbs, it instantly induced thiamine deficiency. So, you know, good sources, it's hard to say what a good source is nowadays of anything because plant sources and animal sources of, of nutrients have gone down. Um, but yeah, pork is traditionally like your best source. Whole grains typically have more thiamine than non-whole grains, but then you also increase your thiamine requirement by ingesting whole grains. So you're, so it's, it's hard to say if that's giving you a net positive or not. So you can't just look at like, does the food have a lot of thiamine? How well is it being absorbed? And is it causing your needs to go up? So it's really good. Most people should probably be supplementing with some type of thiamine just to cover their bases. Um, especially since if you're, if you've been on a low thiamine diet for a long time, the, the enzymes require sometimes very, very high doses to reactivate. Um, and, and that's partly why I think a lot of the people consuming just the bare minimum with fortifi fortified whole grains, it's not enough to reactivate those enzymes that have been shut off due to a very low intake of thiamine for a long period of time. Mm, gotcha. And uh, how much would, if you, if some people would supplement, how much would, uh, would like the optimal dose be? So a lot of studies have looked at benfotiamine, which is um, sort of like a thiamine alternative using anywhere from 350 milligrams twice a day to three times a day, showing benefits on glucose control and type two diabetics, showing benefits on A1C, um, adding probably thiamine HCL 50 milligrams a day to that would probably not be a bad idea. And then the best thiamine supplement is called allithiamine. It's called thiamine tetrahydrofurfural disulfide it was invented in Japan. It's, it's, basically a synthetic form of the thiamine in garlic, which is a very, very highly cell bioavailable and brain bioavailable thiamine, which benfotiamine and thiamine HDL can't really get into the brain. Um, they, uh, benfotiamine has great access to certain cells like red blood cells, but doesn't have good access to the brain. You have to take really high doses. That's why allithiamine, I take all three, thiamine HDL, benfotiamine, and allithiamine. Now, I've tested just taking allithiamine on my own blood sugar level. So my A1C was 5.2 to 5.3. Three months of 300 milligrams of allithiamine took my A1C from 5.2 to 5.3 down to 4.8. Just doing that was the only thing I changed. That's a pretty good move, um, especially in an insulin sensitive range. So, you know, someone who's in a diabetic range could potentially see even better improvements. Mm, well, <laughs> that's, uh, that's awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely need to consider, or maybe I yeah, think about maybe adding time into my supplement list right now, but I'm not uh, taking time in myself. Um, one um, like mineral that I do uh, supplement for the purpose of uh, managing blood sugar and insulin sensitivity is uh, chromium, which is uh, actually also very, very powerful in uh, yeah lowering blood sugar levels and uh, affecting insulin sensitivity. Yeah, chromium is, is hugely underrated. Um, and the, just like thiamine, a lot of things can cause chromium deficiency. We lose it in sweat. When we consume carbohydrates, it releases chromium in the cell to handle that carb. And then we lose that chromium in the urine. And then exercise increases your requirements of chromium as well. So what's really bad is that the bioavailability of chromium is only 1%. So when you lose it, you have to get a hundred fold intake to get, replace that 1% back. So we lose, I don't know, you know, there's certain sweat studies that would suggest that if you sweat for one hour, you may need 100 to 300 to 400 micrograms of chromium to replace what's lost because again, only 1% is bioavailable. So if you lose, you know, one microgram of chromium, 
you need to ingest 100 micrograms to get that one microgram back. Um, so that's really why chromium is so vital. And then there's been numerous studies, anywhere from 200 micrograms to 1,000 micrograms per day, the higher end in those who are type 2 diabetic, showing improvements in A1C glucose control, and even fat loss in muscle gain too, which is kind of interesting, probably because it allows insulin to work better. Insulin drives you know, amino acids and, and you know, synthesis of muscle and things like that too. Yeah, yeah, like that's that's a big, you know, misunderstanding about insulin. They think it's all bad, but insulin has so many like very important roles. Yeah, like you know, muscle growth. It's a very very anabolic hormone. It helps to store nutrients. So if you're like insulin resistant or you don't produce insulin, then yeah, like even the micronutrients aren't able to enter the cells uh, either. So uh, yeah, it's quite crucial. And when it comes to actually, you know, the hypertension and the things of like that, then insulin is the one that like releases this uh, vascular endothelial factor uh, and improves endothelial function whereas in insulin resistance it doesn't happen so it's again you know insulin has like either a good role or a bad role uh, depending on if you're insulin sensitive or if you're insulin uh, resistant yeah and if you're insulin resistant too especially at the cellular level let's go back to magnesium Magnesium is driven into the cell as well as potassium from insulin. So if you're insulin resistant, you are also typically magnesium deficient at the cellular level because you have a lower amount of magnesium and potassium going into the cell. Elevated insulin levels also increase the urinary excretion of magnesium. And so you'll see type 2 diabetics, um, they'll have an elevated urinary magnesium but their ionic magnesium, which is the activated form, um, is, is down in the blood. So typically 50% of type 2 diabetics are magnesium deficient. So they're not activating their thiamine as well, right? And so they're not able to burn their glucose appropriately, which also elevates lactic acid and leads to tissue and, and basically, you know, this acute in certain tissues, ischemia as well. So you can literally have poor glucose metabolism causing oxidative stress, um, tissue ischemia, buildup of lactic acid. So it's, it's just it's just a mess when your body doesn't have the nutrients to allow the metabolic engine to run. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, and what is what what you know causes the insulin resistance in the first place? Like, you know, why does it develop and at like what point like does it develop? So it kind of like what we talked about before, you have you have certain nutrients like chromium, like um, thiamine, like magnesium that have to activate enzymes to metabolize glucose. And so that's part of it. Then you also, we, we, we cover lack of inositol, right? But actually our body makes inositol through magnesium. So magnesium deficiency can also decrease the production of inositol, which when insulin hits its receptor, inositol compounds are released, which cause GLUT4 to rise to the cell and allow glucose into the cell. So there's another pathway, not having enough inositol or being magnesium deficient. Um, and then a lack of salt, sodium, another essential nutrient, uh, I recently published a review of 23 human clinical studies showing that low salt diets induce insulin resistance or worsen fasting insulin or postprandial glucose or postprandial insulin. And there's many mechanisms for that. If you don't get enough of this essential nutrient like salt, you have an activation of noradrenaline um, and catecholamines, which can induce insulin resistance themselves. You have a decrease in blood flow to the skeletal muscle. So you have a decrease in glucose and insulin delivery to the skeletal muscle, hence elevations in, in glucose and insulin um, with low salt diets. And then you have an activation in aldosterone, other stress hormones. So, you know, there's many ways to induce insulin resistance um, at the cellular level. There can be many pathways that are getting broken down. Um, inflammation from overconsuming sugar and carbs as well can cause it. So that's just kind of, you know, what, what yeah. happens. Yeah. There's no like a yeah, single cause. It's not like, yeah, one person is <laughs> eating, let's say too much sugar. And then they're instantly insulin resistant. It's that, yeah, like the combination of all those things. And what happens over time is that, you know, yeah, like the pathology of insulin resistance develops when you know, the pancreas either doesn't produce enough insulin, uh, which usually occurs if the pancreatic beta cells become damaged or there's or the cells themselves uh, become yeah resistant to the insulin that they're not 
you know, allowing the insulin to open the cells. So yeah, like it's all these other factors cause that, you know, oxidative stress inflammation damages the beta, beta cells. And uh, yeah, like when, if, if you're like either like there's too much sugar or carbohydrates consumed too frequently, then the cells become resistant. Uh, or if you are like hyperinsulinemia, like too high insulin levels uh, frequently elevated as well, it makes the cells like tone deaf, for lack of a better word, to the insulin. And uh, yeah, then you, then you just have hyper uh, high circulating of insulin and high circulating of uh, blood sugar at the same time. Yeah. And you, I mean, you can go down the rabbit hole even more where if you consume certain foods like refined seed oils, refined carbs and sugars, if you damage the intestinal um, lining um, and you have an increase in intestinal permeability, that can lead to what's called endotoxemia, right? An increase in lipopolysaccharide in the blood, which can then cause central insulin leptin resistance as well as peripheral because essentially LPS um, can activate toll-like receptors so you have activation of immune cells, which release tumor necrosis factor alpha, literally damaging the parts in the hypothalamus that control satiety and hunger, right? So there is a million pathways that go on in the body that can cause insulin, leptin resistance. And, but it all comes down to a lot of the same things. You're eating the bad foods. You're not eating enough of the good nutrients and the good foods. You're not active enough. You don't have enough muscle. You're not getting enough, maybe sunlight and vitamin D. So, you know, there's a million ways to skin a cat. Yeah, and it actually like varies during the twenty-four hour period as well. So, like at some points of the day, you are more insulin sensitive, and at other times, you're less and more insulin resistant. Because when, you, when you're sleeping, uh, you know, ideally, you should sleep in darkness uh, where you have high circulating melatonin. And melatonin's job is, or I mean, some of the effects of melatonin is that uh, it actually makes you somewhat insulin resistant by blocking the release of uh, insulin by the pancreatic beta cells and i mean melatonin is important for the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant benefits but it does make you like insulin resistant as well which is you know kind of healthy to be that <laughs> you know like a optimally um optimal sleep to be like somewhat insulin resistant and in the daytime you are generally more insulin sensitive because you're not producing melatonin if you're like exposed to sunlight and other lights and uh, yeah like glucose tolerance varies during the daytime as well so and that's one one thing that we cover in the book as well like the circadian rhythm aspect which is very overlooked but uh yeah like actually one of the one of the major determinants of your like daily uh, insulin sensitivity yeah so the simple thing is to make sure you're getting good morning sunlight you're not getting a lot of artificial light at night those are the two keys because sleep deprivation very quickly leads to insulin resistance as well so that is a very overlooked issue is poor sleep and light controls that not getting enough light in the morning, getting too much light, artificial light at night can all mess up your circadian rhythms and hence lead to insulin resistance, prediabetes. Yeah, that's absolutely. Um, we can definitely talk about uh, like the fats as well, because like, you know, first of all, excess fat consumption generally doesn't, you know, directly cause like diabetes but it can certainly induce some aspects of insulin resistance and especially like if you're in a calorie surplus or if you're eating uh, those excess excess fats uh, together with the carbohydrates you mentioned the randall cycle initially in the beginning so yeah we can because yeah like excess or high triglyceride levels are also one of the you know hallmarks of insulin resistance and diabetes so yeah we can cover like the what's the role of fats in this as well yeah. Um, so there's a huge debate on are seed oils harmful or not. Um, it comes down to the type of seed oil, like how it's extracted. Is it cold pressed or is it high heat hexane extracted? That's two, to two totally different oils. One is oxidized, one is not. And then how much are you consuming? Obviously, if you consume a very little bit of oxidized seed oil, it's probably not a big deal. If you consume a fair amount for a long period of time, probably a big deal. And then are you cooking those seed oils? When you cook omega-6 seed oils, particularly highly refined ones, that is going to dramatically increase the harmful effects. So those fats will absolutely harm the body and will contribute to insulin resistance. We know that trans fats too are harmful to the body. Technically, no level of intake of trans fats is healthy. Um, and then in, re in regards to fat, like you said, fat on its own isn't really that harmful. Um, 
it's when you start combining them with carbohydrates where particularly long chain saturated fats uh, seem to induce a little bit more metabolic harm than let's say monounsaturated, which is why like the Mediterranean diet does, it seems to be able to get away with more carbs because you're having more monounsaturated fats just because long chain saturated fats have a lower oxidation rate. Um, and so they don't get burned as easily. And that's a problem. That's not a problem when you're not eating a lot of carb, but that becomes a problem when you start eating 300 grams of carbohydrates, you start eating a lot of butter, heavy cream, right? Um, cheeses, dairies. When you start doing that, the combination of that, that too can be um, pretty, pretty bad regarding fat gain, regarding insulin resistance. Yeah. So like the pathology, that situation is that you, you know, first when you eat like fats, then, uh, if you are eating them together with carbohydrates, then you will see a rise in triglycerides in the blood, which is you know normal to have a rise in triglycerides in the blood. But because you're also eating carbohydrates, your blood sugar rises, and the body still prioritizes you know burning glucose for fuel, and that's why the triglycerides from the fats stay elevated in the blood for longer because you're not in ketosis because of eating carbs, and you're not really burning those um, those fats for fuel either because your body is burning the carbohydrates. If you're in a calorie deficit, then you probably will burn all of that. But if you're, you know, eating like a calorie maintenance or in a surplus, then yeah, like just the triglycerides stay in the blood for elevated, elevated longer time. So you experience this, this uh, hyper triglyceridemia, which then eventually causes this lipotoxicity that starts to damage the uh, beta cells. And uh, yeah, like the different fats have a, like a different effect on the beta cell damage. And yeah, like the saturated fats will generally have like a slightly more damage to the beta cells, whereas like uh, omega-3 fats actually have like one of the least uh, damage. And if you like over time, just, you know, experience this lip lipotoxicity, which yeah, is caused actually by the combination of the sugars and fats through disrupting the Randall cycle, uh, the, the fatty acid glucose oxidation cycle. So that's what is kind of resulting in this uh, lipotoxicity. And over time, it damages the beta cells. And that's when you develop insulin resistance. So the main message is to don't eat like large amounts of fats and carbs together, either eat them separately, or just, you know, if you're in a calorie deficit, then you can still get away with it a little bit. Um, but it's still not like the optimal ideal uh, way to go. Yeah. And, you know, endogenous saturated fats, seem to be driven by your carb intake and Volak and colleagues did some good studies on that, that basically, even though a low carb diet had three times the saturated fat, that when you consumed a diet higher in carbs, the actual saturated fats in the blood were much higher in the higher carb diet. So it's like you, you can sort of dial up or down the saturated fats in your body by dialing up or down the carbs, the carb content really drives a lot of that saturated fat in the body, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. And like the, the Randall cycle just, yeah, refers to your body's like innate function of uh, it chooses. It's like you always burn a mixture of different fuels. You always burn a mixture of carbs, fats, lactate as well, but or ketones. And it's just the, yeah, like the main focus is going to be on one or the other. If you're in ketosis, then you burn mostly fats and ketones. And if you're not in ketosis, which, you know, 90% of other people are, <laughs> then you're going to burn you know, glucose first, and then a little bit of a mixture of fats as well. But yeah, like if you just have too much fats in the blood from eating fats, then it can stay elevated for a bit longer. Yeah. And then the other very confusing thing as well is you have a lot of plant-based um, doctors saying that low carb diets induce insulin resistance. And really it's non-pathological carb intolerance. Like when you don't eat carb, when you give someone an oral glucose tolerance test, they're going to look insulin resistant. Um, which is why you're supposed to be on a moderate carb intake for at least two weeks before you get like an oral glucose tolerance or an insulin assay to determine if you are actually insulin resistant, because we know that consuming a very low amount of carbs for a long period of time will make you carb intolerant. So it's, it's kind of like a short-term non-pathological thing going on. But as you and I both agree, we don't believe that someone should be in chronic ketosis. Um, it's, it's too stressful of a state chronically it's probably not good for thyroid health you need pulses of insulin you need pulses of carbs um for numerous reasons uh metabolic health um mental health thyroid health things like that so um going in and out of ketosis because you are exercising or building muscle or not consuming a ton of carbs is fine but chronic ketosis is probably not a great idea yeah and uh 
it is you know shown that ketogenic diets, low carb diets, they do work in improving insulin resistance and uh, blood sugar levels quite rapidly, and it's slightly better than high carb diets. But uh, at the end of the day, like both diets, whether it's a low carb, high fat diet, or a high higher carb, lower fat diet, they can still result in better you know, glycemic control and better insulin sensitivity over time. It's just in the short term, it appears that, yeah, like a carb restriction in the short term is definitely superior to like a higher carb intake. But yeah, if you're healthy, then there's no reason to, you know, you don't have a metabolic requirement to be on a like a carb restricted diet. Yeah. The other uh, factor that can induce insulin resistance as well is actually not balancing your acid base balance. Um, I've published a couple of review papers on acid base and how the diet affects that. And essentially your interstitial fluid will become acidic much faster than your blood, even though blood pH literally does become more acidic as we age, as we consume, um, a more of a more acidic diet that's not being balanced by base. You will see the pH of the blood go from like 7.42, um, or 7.45 down to like 7.36 and the blood is more acidic, but it's still considered normal, but the interstitial fluid doesn't have the buffering capacity like the blood does. Um, and so the interstitial fluid will become more acidic and thus the receptors, the insulin receptors, you can literally cause insulin resistance by having too much acid in the interstitial fluid. Um, so balancing acid base is important. You don't have to consume plant foods to do that. Um, although fruits and vegetables will offset the acid of animal foods, but you can also consume bicarbonate mineral waters, or you can consume like sodium citrate or sodium bicarbonate. I prefer citrate because it doesn't mess with the pH of the stomach um, supplements to offset some of the acid load of let's say an animal based diet. And that will help also with insulin sensitivity as well. Mm, yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah. Is there anything else that we, obviously there's, yeah, like we said, many other, you know, pathways and mechanisms that contribute to this, but the main overview is, yeah, like insulin resistance is one of the, or is the kind of the main, let's say, cause or driver of diabetes and other uh, glucose intolerance, uh, let's say syndromes and, um, insulin resistance is caused by, yeah, like multiple things. It can be caused by excess carbohydrate intake, excess sugar intake, it can be caused by sleep deprivation, uh, sedent being sedentary, some nutrient deficiencies, circadian mismatch, et cetera. And uh, yeah, like it's possible to reverse that. Um, we didn't cover type 1 diabetes uh, here, but we do talk about it in the book as well, which is unfortunately you know, not like a lifestyle um, caused issue. It's most, mostly like genetic. But uh, yeah, like diabetes is, or like, you know, you can still improve your insensitivity. You can improve your uh, glucose tolerance and uh yeah it doesn't matter if you you know already have pre-diabetes or if you don't if you're already healthy then it's still prevention is the best uh, medicine and it's kind of important to know you know how to actually improve your blood sugar levels yeah and uh yeah people can get the book from uh, amazon it should be out now and uh yeah is there anything else you want to say no i think i think what's really interesting is people are going to find out there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different pairings of foods um, that can help fix their blood sugar besides just what you're typically told, like cut out carbs, right? And so this right. is a refreshing book because it gives a, a complete overview on numerous factors that can induce insulin resistance, prediabetes, type 2 diabetes. Yeah, awesome. And it was great talking with you. And I'll see yep. you around. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you want to support this podcast, then check out our sponsors and leave our review on iTunes or Spotify. My name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.